We're naming this house in honour of Peter Rowe, headmaster from 1957 to 1971. He joined the school in the summer term of 1957, aged 27. Sorry, 29. <laughs> then, and possibly this is a record, the youngest headmaster in England. Um, he is an OS, and he's the son of an OS. In his time, he was head of school, captain of rugby, captain of cricket, captain of hockey, and captain of <laughs> athletics. <laughs> He just said rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> he won an open scholarship in history to St John's College, Cambridge, and gained a first-class degree. He then taught at Brentwood and Repton prior to coming to the college. At Brentwood, he met the lovely Bridget. It's so good to have you <laughs> here today. He was a headmaster during whose tenure there was a substantial amount of building, and I quote from the Chronicle, long overdue, but of necessity postponed owing to the war, a period of building greater perhaps than during any other decade of the school's history. That is until now. <laughs> <laughs> Most notably um, went up in Peter's time the new dining hall that was opened in 1962. That's the year I was born. <laughs> and that probably had one of the biggest transformations in the school as the houses came to eat centrally. A very, very big decision. Additionally, a second floor was added to the library block and a new headmaster's house was built, what the present school community will know as the house mistress's accommodation in Young House. A moderniser, Peter is described in the Centenary Chronicle as a man who was always prepared to try out a new idea. Whether the suggestion was his own or came from the staff or from the boys. One of the greatest changes was perhaps in Schoolhouse, the building he lived in as a boy and as headmaster, and from which the boys of Row House have now moved. He was also headmaster at the time of T.K. Collett, his chair of governors, who was chairman of the Development Fund Appeal Committee that sought to provide the funding for a series of projects. Rather a nice connection, therefore, that Collett House, the new boys' day house next door, is a part of this build. The College Road connection continues. At the recent 50th anniversary reunion to a man, these former pupils spoke affectionately and with great warmth about Peter and Bridget as housemaster and as headmaster. Simon Leake, old Stortfordian, will no doubt like to remind Peter of the time when Simon got in a serious trouble for accidentally spilling a plate of scrambled eggs one breakfast time into the headmaster's lap. <laughs> um, I thought that was the reason that uh, Simon was gated for six weeks, but apparently that was something to do with a liaison. <laughs> um, another OS reminded me of the time that he bowled Peter out for a duck in the OS game against the first 11, and the very magnanimous way in which Peter congratulated him after the defeat and for getting him out. Many other old boys have expressed their delight to me that we were able to retain the name of the building, Schoolhouse, for the building they knew so well, whilst honouring the name of Peter and Bridget Rowe in the naming of this boy's house. Peter was the last head to be housemaster of Schoolhouse, something he did for a year during an interregnum. However, and I quote again from the Chronicle, it was considered undesirable that the headmaster in modern conditions should continue to act as housemaster. It's therefore, it seems to me, doubly appropriate that Roe name is to be attached to the successor to Schoolhouse. Peter was an orator and a man of great good humour. And this was clear when in his final address at the then end of term dinner for pupils and staff, he said this to the boys. Go out into the world and have babies. And <laughs> get married. <laughs> but not in that order. <laughs> this is true. And so it is with considerable pleasure that I welcome back on behalf of the whole college community my predecessor but two, Mr Peter Rowe, his wife Bridget, 
and their family. <coughs> their son Crispin is a former fellow HMC headmaster himself, and who I knew long before I realised the connection between the Rowe family and the college. I think you probably can imagine, uh, as a family, a Rowe family here, of being um, a bit humbled uh, to have your name set in stone, literally in this way, and put on ties. It's actually rather awesome, and we are extremely grateful to the school for, doing, for making this gesture. Uh, Peter is in good voice, as you hear, um, but he asked me to make a, a speech on his behalf. He might perk up later, or he might go to sleep, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, uh, it's very poignant for me, as you can imagine, of uh, his son to make a speech on... Thank you. Oh. <laughs> applause already. Um, make a speech on both Peter, Bridget's behalf, and indeed of the whole family. So thank you very much for that. In talking to Peter over the last few months about this occasion, he's been very keen to stress this longevity of association between the Rowe family and the school. His father, Gerald, here as a boy, before the war, as Jeremy was hinting, he obviously thought so much of the school that uh, he sent both Peter and his elder brother, John, here. I think it is completely apocryphal to claim that they were all, they were both, had, uh, captains of cricket and rugby and but let's be apocryphal <laughs> <laughs> certainly Peter was head boy but it was as Jeremy hints it was his return here only about 10 or 11 years after leaving as headmaster which was quite remarkable I spent most of my career trying to become an HMC headmaster <laughs> I only managed it later in life for, for, for my father Peter to become headmaster age 29 was unprecedented in the HMC annals, and uh, it must have reflected some enlightened minds around the governor's table. I'm sure those minds are still there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps not the same individuals, but um, to, for, for governors to appoint a, a head age 29 was quite remarkable. I'm not quite sure what Peter got up to as uh, a headmaster. As, a, as children, it rather passes you by what your parents do. Um, I remember running around schoolhouse dormitories in the holidays playing hide-and-seek mm -hmm. or basking by the what was then outside swimming pool um, chatting up the girls no <laughs> sledging down Sparrow's Meadow we might be doing that later today <laughs> those were very precious memories childhood memories for me and my brother Patrick and my sister Claire uh, they were very precious but we didn't really get to know the fabric of the people who were here well enough and it, I must say, thank you so much to the old Stortfordians who are here of that vintage. I've talked to one or two of them to make today so special. It's, it's very touching that you've made the effort to come back today, despite the, the snow, uh, to recognise what Peter did for the school. Headmasters like the sound of their own voices, even former headmasters like the sound. <laughs> so I won't go on. Underpinning, and I know the ethos of a school like this, uh, is that the school functions as a community. Again, these are phrases that trip off the tongues of headmasters, the extended family of the school. But you will all know that that's actually a very real thing. Schools like this depend on the quality of the community that they generate. The epitome of that is my mother. Oh. You, you can imagine, this is rather poignant for me to be making a speech about my parents, but, <laughs> but let me do it. My mother, uh, Bridget here, gave tirelessly of herself. As we drove past Northgate End this morning, she reminded me that she used to teach part-time at Northgate. I was a, a child there. <clears throat> for her to be the headmaster's wife, to give so tirelessly of herself to the school, and also teach part-time at Northgate, it was quite remarkable, and I, I do. Yeah, yeah. Paying yeah, yeah. a tribute to them. <laughs> um, 